Well, this is the eighth day of February. Yes. March. The baby March. Side. Yeah, March for eighth. March the eighth, nineteen sixty-five. We're in the uh, <coughs> Oklahoma Historical Society. Editorial office. Editorial office. And Miss Muriel Wright, correct? Muriel H. Muriel H. Wright. What's the H stand for? Hazel. Hazel. Mm-hmm. Muriel Hazel Wright. The reason I have to have that H is um, I, they, I've become known. There were other Muriel Wrights, one from Nova Scotia whom I met and I knew at Columbia University when I was up there and mm-hmm. born at college. And um, then uh, it seemed that one uh, Muriel Wright came in to Oklahoma City. Uh, she's the wife of someone by the name of Wright, and she was born down in Greer County. Well, uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, there was a big advertisement and spread um, one day mm-hmm. uh, in the paper of a beauty salon established by Muriel Wright. <laughs> well, immediately my friends, oh, are you establishing a beauty salon? Well, I'll go to your beauty salon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was put out because uh, the, the, uh, I had had an approach before. Uh-huh. by one of this woman's relatives, and they were really using the, my name in a little way. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I talked pretty stiff. I said, now, you could have done something about that. Mm-hmm. Of course, I didn't want to be tangled up as any beauty salon. And, uh, of course, that came in, but I guess I was a little bit more disturbed than I should have been. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to got a bad re- reputation from that. You a native Oklahoma? I was born, reared in Oklahoma. My father was born and reared in Oklahoma. My grandfather came mm. in 1834 to Oklahoma as a small boy. My grand, that is a paternal grandfather. My ma- uh, maternal, my paternal my grandmother came in 1855. My mother came in 1887 mm-hmm. to the Indian Territory and was a teacher there, all connected with, well, of course, Grandfather was with the Choctaws. He was of Choctaw descent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often have the question given, uh, as to whether my Grandfather, who was the Reverend Allen Wright, there's his bust up there. It's cast in bronze, and it's in the Hall of Fame at Anadarko, Indian Hall of Fame. Anyway, they've uh, asked me about their relationship uh, to the Reverend Alfred Wright, Mm -hmm. who was a great missionary, who was the first of the ABCFM missionaries who came with the uh, Choctaws in uh, the removal of Mississippi. Now, he was the first prominent missionary to come with the earliest group in 1832 which was a very hard trip. And uh, now the other missionaries came as they could settle up their business in Mississippi, and they moved too. Mm -hmm. But he was the first one. And they um, uh, founded the Wheelock Mission down in uh, the old church down there. Um, Of course, he founded the church in December 1832, and they had a log church and churches before that in the mission. But in 18, uh, about 1845, uh, 40, early 46, they conceived the idea of all the Choctaws getting together and building them a special, ni- a very good stone church. Mm. And this church was built in 1846, and it's the oldest church standing in Oklahoma. Uh, understand, the organization was before that. Mm-hmm. Well, it is still standing, and it's in the um, uh, Southern Presbyterian Church. They own it. And it's still uh, a really a relic of historic times. Well, now my grandfather was named for him. So um, the Allen, the name Allen, was from a relative, a family that uh, related in the uh, Choctaw way, um, by the name of Samuel Allen. And so they gave him, my grandfather, the name Allen Wright, so as to distinguish it mm-hmm. from Alfred Wright. See, he, did, he had an individual Indian name. He was a full blood in Choctaw. And uh, then um, as he went, when he went to school, they, uh, the custom of the day, the um, 
chalk dolls had individual names and all these little boys and girls in these neighborhood schools and the New England teachers would uh, be sent down and they would see all these little uh, full-blood Indians and with these hard, very difficult names. So the um, Indian office and the uh, American Board of Commissioners, Foreign Mission, the missionaries, instituted the name, uh, custom of giving each one an English name. Well, if you gave one child, one little Indian, in your group an English name, you'd have to name them all. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a problem for the teacher to get a number name. So therefore you have Thomas Jefferson, Tom, George Washington, <laughs> and all the uh, missionaries were named, had namesakes and prominent people, and I, d I don't know the Calhoun, yes, there was a Clay, mm -hmm. a Henry Clay, but there were, I don't think there was a Calhoun, but I don't <coughs> know of any. But, and uh, so my grandfather then, uh, was named Alan Wright. He came as a small boy on the Trail of Tears. Well, mm. so I stem, we stem back. We feel as if we've had a little bit of experience. And I should say it's extremely interesting. Uh, of course, the grandfather uh, was the, um, left an orphan and uh, his mother died. They would have come on the 32, 1832, removal, but um, his mother died in uh, childbirth and left a little a baby girl, the only uh, little sister, a sister that my grandfather had. They were two brothers and himself. And that left the father, Ishtamahalubi, with these four children, and they couldn't come on account of the baby, and mm -hmm. the grandmother took charge. And uh, so they came later, in 33, 34. Overland in a self-emigrating party, mm -hmm. but that is a kind of a a story. There's a lot of sto a lot about that that he writes in his biography, in his own handwriting. But uh, that, and I've learned more about it. Quite a story about his coming as a small boy over the Trail of Tears with his family, and they settled down uh, around. Uh, uh, well, I can't think of the name of it. It's the name of the, uh, of the stream. It's down there near uh, where Broken Bow, Old Look Fada. Mm -hmm. I'll get the name of the stream in a minute. Anyway, um, the custom of the day, the um, Choctaws established neighborhood schools. And um, the American Board of Commissioners would furnish the teacher. And this first school, this older brother was allowed to, chosen to go to this neighborhood school. And um, then the grandfather uh, was so, oh, he wanted to go so bad physically with his father, uh, with his brother. And um, he just was heartbroken because he couldn't go to school. There wasn't enough room. But they uh, encouraged him, and so then finally he went to school. And uh, in that then, uh, whether, his, uh, whether his oldest brother, who was Willis Wright, grandfather became Alan Wright, and the next boy became Jesse Wright, and the next was Rachel, uh, they called her Kate Wright. Mm -hmm. And uh, each one of them had an Indian name, of course, and they were the children of Ishtamahalabi. And the full-blood mother, who is of, of uh, great prominence back in Mississippi and the old full-blood Choctaw, a big story about him. Anyhow, uh, my grandfather came out of this school, neighborhood school experience with the name Alan Wright. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any relatives except the immediate family mm -hmm. by the name of Wright. Now, um, to not use up your tape, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, Grandfather Alan Wright was, uh, is the one who uh, suggested and gave the name Oklahoma to a proposed Indian territory um, which included all the country within the boundaries of Oklahoma except Panhandle, because that was a public lands. 
1866, when the uh, delegations of the five tribes were called into Washington to make new treaties. And uh, our grandfather had been uh, sent to this Spencer Academy, and he had been prepared to go to college. And he had been baptized at this old Wheelock church with the name Alan Wright in 46, 1846. And two years later, he was one of the first five boys chosen to go to an Eastern college. The uh, Treaty of Dancing Rabbit, which provided for the removal of all the Choctaws from Mississippi, set up a fund, which they call the, the, 20, uh, the 40 Youth Fund, I think it is in a general title, in, a, in that treaty, a sum of money that would educate these boys as they were ready in their studies. Mm -hmm. Well, um, grandfather happened to be one of the first. And um, <coughs> he was sent to um, Delaware, he was sent to Newark College, which is now the University of Delaware at Newark, Delaware, not Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It's Newark, right. spelled two names. And um, he um, went there for one year. Well, they were having some um, uh, question of, um, uh, about that uh, Newark, Delaware college, and they couldn't uh, keep up the um, necessary college course uh, some way they their funds there was mm -hmm. a it was a uh, on working on a foundation see it wasn't state then mm -hmm. in Delaware so there came the question then that the boys the Choctaw boys especially Alan Wright after he'd been there a year uh, which college he should attend and um, authorities promoted Princeton well um, they came along, and some of the Choctaws and some objected to Princeton. They said there was too much drink in there. They didn't want Alan Wright going to Princeton. So the uh, result was that he was sent to Union College, theological, uh, no, th Union College in Schenectady, New York. He remained there and took his ma a BA degree in 52. Now, he, understand, um, he stayed in the East seven years, uh, and uh, he was a, a very, uh, I think, a boy, of pr a young man of presence, and, and uh, everybody liked him, and he was bright and, and uh, affable and a very fine student, a brilliant, kind of a brilliant mind. Uh, that is, a steady mind, anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Uh, he then uh, decided, uh, through the influence, I'm sure, of those in charge at Union, decided to go into the ministry and who went to theological seminary, Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Mm -hmm. And he finished there. And, uh, of course, he had specialized in Greek and I have his old Greek uh, dictionary and his and Hebrew and his Hebrew books and he became um, in, he studied Hebrew and Latin he, he could write just off in Latin as well as he could in English almost and uh, of course he knew Choctaw and uh, when he finished then he uh, came back under he was um, entered in as the minister, as a minister of the Presbyterian Church, the Synod of New York, and he made his trial piece before them in his examination for this position. Um, in Latin, I have it written out. Mm. And then he was made an honorary member of the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions, which was quite an honor because the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions had, was the one that did all this background work of the early missions among the five tribes. Mm -hmm. And it was through that, you see, in Spencer Academy that he was named after this old mm -hmm. Dr. Alfred Wright. And uh, then he came back to the Indian Territory, to Choctaw Nation, and was a principal of the uh, Armstrong Academy. And that was a, quite, that was a boys' school. 
and that was quite a prominent, uh, of nice position. But he didn't like that as well. He didn't like the teaching field. He had trained for the preaching field. So he then uh, was uh, established in the Presbytery, uh, uh, let's see, the Synod of Pre um, Presbytery of Indian, Indian, that was it, Presbytery of Indian, I believe that's it, or Synod of Indian. Anyway, he was assigned then to uh, several stations to preach, and uh, in the meantime, he had married um, my grandmother, who came as a missionary teacher. And he was quite um, very well, um, he, well, he was a scholar of the uh, Choctaws and had his master's degree. They awarded him his master's degree for his three work years' work in um, the theological seminary with such high standing back at his alma mater in uh, Union. I had his little, you know, always the boy under the board of directors. He was awarded the master's degree. Now, he is the first Indian to learn from the Indian territory to learn the master's degree. So he was in a place to really uh, uh, be of great worth to the Choctaws. And in doing this treaty, a provider in 66, he was one of the delegates and one of the young men. And he was with the Choctaws. And he was, they were uh, getting up the provisions of this. Now, this is too long maybe for this. No, it isn't. Uh, they were uh, discussing the question of organizing what is now Oklahoma, except the Panhandle, of course, that was, a mo that was public lands, as an Indian territory. All the tribes and, and um, any tribe or any Indian nation was to have delegates to a, a central legislative council body. The, um, rules and regulations and the form for setting up this territory were given in detail in the Choctaw Treaty. All of the treaties had one little paragraph providing that they would have this territory. But they were discussing the uh, Choctaw Treaty with the details of how they should go about organizing. And uh, it was to be laid and made out and stipulated in the Choctaw Chickasaw Treaty. And so all the delegations were called into this large room, the Cherokees and the Seminoles and the different ones who were there in Washington making two new treaties with the federal government because of the recent war. See, we joined the Confederacy. My grandfather was sitting at the desk, and um, as a linguist, he knew the Choctaw. He was writing down on one sheet the Choctaw translation of what they were doing in the treaty that would go in the treaty, and on this side, the English. And in the midst of it, they came to the point, well, what would they call the territory? So one of the officials, probably the um, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, said, well, what would you call your territory? Well, he was sitting there absent-mindedly riding around. He said, immediately, Oklahoma. Now, that Choctaw name is synonymous with Indian. There isn't any word in the Choctaw language for Indian. Oklahoma means red people. And in the early treaties, they'd speak of the Choctaw Nation of Red People. The red people. We were the red race way back in early treaties. So that came naturally. Okla meaning people, and Homa meaning red. And they, it's a, a, a word that has more or less uh, been... Me, it's a made word, like a uh, mnemonic, mm -hmm. we would call it, in our language. And in English, it really means Indian, or literally red people. They are red. Mm -hmm. So it was written down that, in this treaty, that the governor of this proposed territory should be named by the executive department of the, um, uh, be uh, titled, he was to be appointed by the executive of the United States, and he was to be titled the governor of the territory of Oklahoma. Well, my grandfather, now, he did a prodigious amount of work in his 59 years of his life, and he didn't think much about that Oklahoma because 
Uh, he died long before Oklahoma Territory. But the name, anyway, was written in the treaty, and it became popular. The first time that Congress wanted to organize this territory under its jurisdiction, aside from the provisions that were made in the territory, uh, in the territorial provisions of the Choctaw Treaty, they wanted to name it the Territory of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Well, we were all South, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, our representatives and so forth in Congress, well, the word name didn't just click because this was to be an Indian country, you see. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that they were opposed to the name Lincoln, I don't think, as they were to the idea that it was to be a white <coughs> man's. This was to be Indian. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, the Congress followed that um, trend later. And the first time, I think, that you'll find it in a bill was in 1870, providing for the organization of a territory of Oklahoma in 1870 by <coughs> Senator Rice of Arkansas. And on from that time, the name was popular with the boomers and trying to open this. Now, this was the railroads back of it. And uh, finally then, um, after my, my grandfather said, he looked, uh, he'd think back on it, and he told a story about how he had spoken up so quickly, Oklahoma, and they put that down in the treaty. And all the other delegates, the older, very dignified Indians, thought that he had spoken out of turn. They just started, thought mm -hmm. up. And he used to laugh and say how he had given that name so quickly, and they put it down, and the others had uh, risen up and didn't say a word. But their attitude was, well, you spoke out of turn. This ought to be a question of deliberation, don't you know? Well, <laughs> so he told, and he never, he never knew anything about the territory of Oklahoma. And so that was how it was named, and it was popular, and it came on down. It sure has. It sure has. Well, then in turn, um, now my grandfather, I had his um, written address in his own handwriting. He addressed a um, an organization in, uh, I think it must have been Union College of the Young Men. It was a boy, man, uh, boys college, men, young men. And uh, one of their uh, debating societies, which was quite something in their program, and in this, he um, maintained that it was the only saving of the Choctaws for the removal. We have always taken the attitude. I have that to this day. So our people, our family, have come down always <coughs> with the idea of, of um, opening the country. Uh, progress. The one remark of my grandfather after the war when he was elected chief without his knowing it, he was in Washington when he was in the treaty, they elected him chief of the Choctaws and he got the word. He debated whether it was the thing for him to do because he thought that he had been involved in the Civil War in the uh, army, uh, the Confederate army and all, that uh, he should was neglecting his his work in the mission field and in the educational field and in the preaching. And uh, he debated it. And uh, he made uh, the remark, someone has said rather bitterly, he said, the, uh, this great war was a terrible thing that has happened to us. It set us back 40 years. The bright future hopes of the Choctaws have been set back 40 years. So that's what he faced and a reconstruction when he was made chief. So um, always he was for promoting the development, education, Christianization, and uh, of all of, the, of this territory. And the Choctaws, the leading Choctaws took his um, his uh, a lot followed him in that. Now, of course, there's a lot. There are a lot of political angles, forth and back and forth, in this and a lot of background of history. 
Um, when it came to the time of organizing what is became Oklahoma Territory, see, it wasn't organized till a year after the run in 1890. There were, um, the Choctaws took the stand that they didn't want a separate uh, territory of their own, of the Indians, just on the west side, that this was all Indian, that it must be kept together so that the west side and the east side should be kept as one territory, one state. And they were not, for, uh, and my father was consistently always for the um, single statehood. He didn't take, he didn't, uh, he wasn't for the Sequoia movement. Nor, and he was a physician and surgeon, and he, and he was president of the Indian Territory Medical Association in 1904 and promoted his strength and his idea besides his political influence in the Indian Territory toward the single statehood idea. And so he introduced a uh, resolution when he was president and they met at Tulsa, uh, the Indian Territory Medical Association, and he introduced, made quite a speech, and it's in the old medical journal of the Union of the Oklahoma Territory Medical Association and the Indian Territory Medical Association as one. And it was accomplished. And the Oklahoma Territory, State, Ter State Medical Association was organized then, one year before statehood. Hmm. That was the point. You know, that, there is a lot of politics back from all that. Because <laughs> in the meantime, there were people, <coughs> uh, leaders in Oklahoma Territory prominent leaders in Oklahoma Territory that uh, got uh, disheartened and they wanted to disorganize Oklahoma Territory and go in as single mm -hmm. and then just uh, gradually absorb Indian Territory, but we wouldn't have any of that. And it was right, we, we won. And the Indian Territory, uh, Oklahoma Territorial side in poli politics, uh, there is, has been the remained a strong side in the political life of Oklahoma. Hmm. Now, <laughs> what do you want to know about Oklahoma City? I'm, I've gotten into a thing, and they say I talk too much now, I'm quitting. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, that's extremely interesting. But it was Alan Wright who suggested it, and it means red people, and the name means red people, and it is just, uh, just an incident in his life because he had a great influence. Uh, quiet. His home was at Boggy Depot, and he reared his children. He sent every one of his children and his, his two nephews of this, this sister who died, left two boys, and he reared them. That was ten, there were 10 children, mm -hmm. and he, he saw that they were all educated. Of course, they had the right of one child being sent under the nation, and that was my, to be educated, that was my uncle, because he was going to go into the ministry. My father was a doctor, so he bought it out and worked and practically uh, earned his own uh, degree, medical degree, MD. Of course, they and it's a very interesting history of, um, and of a family. And I just was mur brought into it and in the fact that uh, Dr. J.B. Thoburn, who was a resident of Oklahoma City, knew my father and mother when he, uh, and he came to my father um, when he was writing, when Dr. Uh, Thoburn was writing his 1916 history on the history of Oklahoma. And uh, he asked my father, my father gave him a good many suggestions for his first 1916 history. Well, when he was approached then, in about in 1925 or 26, to do another history of Oklahoma, Dr. Thoburn, who was a resident of Oklahoma City, was with the Historical Society since 1902, had established the Chamber of Commerce here in Oklahoma City, worked out of old Epworth uh, College, which is now the Uni Oklahoma City University. He was quite a figure in, in, in Oklahoma City. 
So when he went to pick up this new history, he asked in Trinidad, he asked my father to collaborate with him. Well, my father was busy and uh, was active in um, his uh, in other things, and he didn't. And I, in the meantime, had written uh, the first uh, history textbook back in '22, and um, the story of Oklahoma on uh, the contract, and so. Um, my father uh, encouraged me to uh, fill his place. I was working uh, with my father on as on the secretary with the on the Choctaw Committee, and that's another story too. Uh, to get a settlement of all our Choctaw affairs from 1922, so I fell into the, uh, or you might say that, uh, into this interest of of um, the history and going into the large and the definitive history, Oklahoma history of the state and its people with Dr. Sobert. Now, I was not with the Historical Society any more than a member and uh, contributing uh, articles to the magazine. And um, then, uh, now, I did most uh, of my writing on this uh, large a definitive edition, which was published in 29, in collaboration with Dr. Sobern, down at our home, which was in the in collaboration with Dr. Sobern, down at our home, which was in the old Choctaw Nation where we were had our allotment down on our farm and ranch in near Alney in Oklahoma. And I did my writing down there. Oh. And uh, then out into the field, did field work. And uh, the book was published. And uh, then my father became very ill and we brought him to Oklahoma City and he died here and in uh, 1932. And uh, then he, we took him back, and he is in the old Bobby Depot Cemetery right there uh, right near the grave of his father and mother, Alan Wright, and his wife, Harriet Mitchell Wright, mm. and others of the family. Then my mother then, about 10 years later, died, and she's not Indian. She's not Indian, not any Indian, but she is buried there. Well, uh, our home was broken up, and um, I came to Oklahoma City and um, uh, was remained here then. Uh, and my mother, before my mother died, uh, I was kind of freelance writing in Oklahoma City. With my si I stayed at my sister's home, Ms. Garcy Reed. And they were, Mr. Reed was an architect. Um, uh, the, uh, Garcy Reed is known in the architectural field. He became president of the architectural, uh, State Architectural Association, and then he was one of the first members of the National Association uh, of, uh, as an architect out of Oklahoma. So uh, they have a history, and my only sister was his wife, and uh, she's still living. He died, and she's still living and very active and in the Architectural Association, uh, uh, the Reed Associates. My nephew is uh, their son, as uh, John A. Reed is the head of that, and so forth. Well, anyway, I r remain in Oklahoma City and uh, freelanced it, wrote another history of Oklahoma. It was adopted. My first book was adopted in '39. And then in uh, 1942, uh, I believe it was, the legislature provided for a um, position here as the editor, the ed editor of the Chronicles. Now, the Chronicles had been run by the secretary, but it was had grown, and it was just too much. One person couldn't do it, so I happened to be elected by the board to do that. And so I have been in Oklahoma City since 
1932 as a resident, not as a owner of property here, but as a, I was resided here. And I've been ident identified mo with uh, the women's organization, member of the church, the Presbyterian Church, First Presbyterian Church. But my interests have been uh, more or less out in the state because of the work here in the Oklahoma State Historical Society. Roots were put down deep, weren't they? Yes. And um, in through this, there have been stress, there has been a time or two, I should say, there have been times of stress to hold this uh, history in that we have had, uh, Oklahoma is peculiar. It has been formed with a waves, waves of migration, waves of settlement. First is your Indian, the five civilized tribes, way back in the 30s, that dominated. Then, um, because the five tribes joined the Confederacy, the United States government, the federal government, required new treaties with the five tribes and penalized them to fit the expediency of the moment with all the rest of the Indian tribes in many, many states. The whole idea was to move them and put them on reservations in this area. Had started out of Jefferson's idea in 1803 that all the Indians east of the Mississippi should be moved to this newly acquired territory of Louisiana. And there have developed because he thought of the annihilation of many great tribes in the colonial wars on the Atlantic seaboard. Now, there was a reason for all this. He, it wasn't a question of going in and taking the guns and fighting the five tribes. They had been too, they were too large for the infant republic to handle. Therefore, um, now, today we have, was it humanitarian? Purely humanitarian <coughs> on the part of Jefferson. Or was there always back of it the matter of expediency to clear the land? Yeah. Nevertheless, the idea was promoted from 1843 by Jefferson's administration by the leaders. The only thing to do, Madison, was interested in these great tribes in the southeast. The Western Frontier Movement, one of the great movements in history of the colonial seaboard, white people pushing out, the frontier going out had started <coughs> when the pilgrims, the Puritans, and the earliest colonists made their settlements on the seaboard in Virginia. Virginia mean taking in New England. Mm -hmm. This idea of removing all the Indians kept going until when Andrew Jackson became president, it came to a head. For one of the reasons, the the frontier movement was becoming almost unruly because you can talk about having your ancestors back to that those frontiersmen. But my tell you, my dear, oh, that on the border of this frontier movement, you have virtually an outlaw gang with their knives and their guns mm -hmm. pushing their way. They discovered gold in the Cherokee country. Oh, there was a rush. Get the Cherokees out of Georgia. 
<laughs> before that, the Cher Choctaws, way before that, the frontier had come to Mississippi. We must get in there and get those Choctaw lands. We're going to have them. Why? It was commerce. New Orleans had built up. The big plantation idea was uh, uh, taking root, founding your big, in the money making. Get in there and get this land. So that's what they stuck up against. So they decided then to, they brought it up to the leaders of the Choctaws. I'll take them as an example. Mm -hmm. Now you can stay in Mississippi if you become citizens. And you can become citizens. I won't go any farther than this. Or right. you can move to the new land that we have assigned you uh, way back in 1820 beyond the Mississippi. But here was the, uh, the question of the Choctaws. There were 18,000 full-blood Choctaws. They were really foreigners in their own country. They had lived there from prehistoric times. They still had their own language, their own customs. They didn't, they couldn't m go in and go under a uh, um, uh, new kind of uh, English and all that. It was new to them. They had been identified with the French anyway in early days. And Mississippi couldn't police its, its own forces because there, this frontier was moving in and there were just a lot of ruffians coming in to among on the Choctaws and getting them up and, and perfectly good people along the Choctaw, full blood, sitting there quietly doing, tending to their own business and not having anything, uh, fighting or anything. But they'd come in and they'd uh, pick up a, a quarrel and then they'd uh, drive them out, see? Yeah. So it was a question of a police force. So if this had all uh, come up, so the leaders said, we've had assigned us a great country down by west of Arkansas in the west, the best thing for us to do is to make a treaty and we'll remove all our people there. And that's how we came, and Grandfather said it was the only thing to do, because they, um, they were meeting up against a uh, force that was uncontrollable, incontrollable or uncontrollable. And, uh, and Andrew uh -huh. Jackson was a friend of the Choctaws, but of course it went on and the Cherokees stayed too long and then therefore they they got the brunt of it and they didn't come till about eight or nine years later <laughs> and so they have the onus and so poor Andrew Jackson uh, he wrote a very sensible a resume and address to the Congress and addressed them on this Indian question but it was a great question before the United States Congress some great debates as to the uh, right of it. And it was not moral. It was not moral. It was a question of expediency. Because Jefferson himself said, now my dear children, your great father thinks that you should go to this country where uh -huh. you will have it free and will not have uh, the uh, conflicts, in so many words, <laughs> that you have had. Then <coughs> on the, n the next time he'd write to one of his uh, fellow uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. Get the Indians out of there and we can develop the country. So many words. <laughs> but, uh, but price of progress, huh? What yeah. a price. What a price of progress. The, pr the price was the way the removal was done. You see, just the same thing that has come, that we have, are striking today. Progress meant, if you were to take up that point of progress, uh, it would cost money to be done right. Uh, they remember now we were in the period, oh, no taxes. Then, uh, we must uh, hold down expense. We must this and that and the other. But they were establishing the financial background of our nation. And uh, they were parsimonious. Do this. But the army officers and the agents who were appointed to bring these people out, were they given the funds? They, the agents and the army officers, the letters, 
they were sympathetic with these people that they were bringing out, these Indians, mm -hmm. because they liked them. They were, they were trying to do everything. But it was awful. Why, they'd go through the country and they'd have to buy supplies. What did these old, uh, the farmers way back in the backwoods, they'd have about a hundred bushels of corn. Well, I'm going to get all the money I can out of it. They couldn't sell corn hardly, but they'd charge them two dollars, well, a bushel. To keep their people from starving, their bunch, from, uh, their group from starving, the, the army officer would have to fork up the money right then. Mm. Same way with wagons and teams and all. And then these blizzards fell on them, and oh my. And the people, the women, and ha they'd have to walk through swamps. One time they walked 30 miles waist deep in water. Oh. And the cold blizzards down on them. Well, <coughs> the Choctaws were the first of the group as a nation to come. And it was in a period of three years, and they, they chose to come in the fall of the year, in the cool weather, rather than come in the summer because it was hot, you see. And, and it was slowed up, and then they'd get caught in these blizzards. Well, uh, they were uh, so, it, it was about as hard on the army officers and the agents who were conducting these parties as it was on the Indians, because they, they, were, they liked the people that they were, had in charge, most of them. Some of them were hard-hearted, but it was so that it, it really was a trail of tears. And the, there isn't just one road a trail of tears. It's all the roads through Tennessee and from Mississippi River through Arkansas and through Missouri and Illinois, southern Illinois, and all the roads that the Indians traveled during that period from 1830 to 1842. And they came in groups, you understand. Not, but yeah. no, there's nothing like it in the history of the world. Because no nation had ever undertaken to move a whole, whole, whole race, a whole na nationality. So there were a great problem, oh. and back of it was that the that was the lack of proper planning and the money. Naturally, you know, you get in politics. Mm -hmm. Money is seems to be all important. Well, it is. It's our medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. Money in itself. Don't think about money. But what does money do? It is the medium by which we operate. That's the old common denominator. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it uh, being the common denominator, way back there in 1830, uh, had its effect, and that was the reason that it that uh, the removal. Besides the fact that the people did not want to, the main. The, the majority of those people didn't want to go away from their homes. They were living quietly, and they weren't hurting anybody, and they were tending in their own business. <laughs> but be just like you, where you have a home. All right, I'm sitting here, I'm comfortable, and I'm going to have my home. All right, you know, somebody come along, you get out. It's better for you to go off somewhere else. And they just pick you up and put you over there. <laughs> yeah, that was the part. The difference... Uh, well, now that was a wave of immigration. They came and they didn't want to. And yet some of them saw the light. They saw that it was a wonderful country. The leaders came out here and they said, oh, that's a beautiful country. They, they were sensible. Mm. And of course then, they, you come on and then uh, after the Civil War, the uh, government uh, went on with that idea of having an Indian territory. And then they were going to take all the tribes that there were any remnants left. Mm. Colorado, well, three-fourths of the state of the United States has the descendants of the Indians have come from those different states within the borders of Oklahoma. Mm. But 67 tribes and parts of tribes represented, and they represent three-fourths of the United States. They've been moved to this region, and their descendants were living here. Mm. Now, uh, then you have another wave of Indian migration. Now, with this wave of Indian migration, you have your army posts, the great leaders, West Point graduates, great army officers, 
in the history of the United States had their training when they come out of the uni uh, they, they come out here. Supposedly that it was on enemy territory or police, they were the police force type for the five tribes because the five tribes said, well, we, the Seminoles said, well, we don't want to get over there and be moved way out there to the edge of the, uh, where the Comanches are and be uh, with a lot of rogues. They're, they're wiping up and uh, marching and riding up and down through the plains and stealing down and having fight in Texas. We don't want to get in with that group. Said, we're not rogues. <laughs> And that hasn't been done. Well, <laughs> that was their idea then. That was the expression used. Anyway, then you come on and um, uh, you have immigration through here. And then immediately after settling, then came the question of the railroads and the building. And then came the white pushing to right. come in. And in that, you have nine different openings in Oklahoma. And each one of these openings brought in a group of people. Mm. Besides that, with the railroads, you have a foreign element to take the coal mines over in the Choctaw Nation. To work the coal mines it was a great thing. Well, the, the mining companies that leased those uh, mining mines from the Choctaws, mm -hmm. they had to have miners. Yeah. Who'd they bring in? They brought in the Italians. Oh, and there were, there were uh, groups particularly the Italians by around uh, Krebs and some of Colgate and all oh. in that Colgate. Oh. Well, so that made another farm. Then in this land, uh, these uh, land openings, you have the Czechs, German groups. Uh, well, the German groups came in in western Oklahoma, some in uh, Greer County, but some out uh, with the Mennonite churches. And um, they're in... Uh, they were around um, Cloud Chief and, Clo and Clinton and all in there, and up uh, around Kingfisher and up in that region. And uh, then out here at Prague, we call it Prague, it's Prague, we have the Czechs coming in in 1891 to that opening. And then every one of these Indian openings, there was a group. So that we are a cosmopolitan group in Oklahoma. Now, in the background, uh, you, uh, they say, well, but what about then, of course, the uh, question of the Negro. The Negro was brought in as the slave. The Southern institution, these wealthy, mixed-blood planting groups of the tribe tribes, even John Ross had his slaves. They lived in the Southern way. They lived in the South. They had Southern institutions. So that involved them in this civil war. And the gr next to the removal for the great, oh, I say impasse or terrible uh, event in the history of the five tribes was the removal. They made it and they come into a wonderful country and they did build up. Many of them died, it was terrible. And so it's, just, it's a romantic, it's a wonderful epic but the Civil War was the worst thing that ever happened to any of them. To all the Indians, all the United States, the Civil War is the, is the emotional peak. And it didn't solve many of the problems that have come even down to the day. Well, now in Oklahoma City, go back to Oklahoma City. I don't know what you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Along the same line that you're talking about, the this marvelous history of Oklahoma, and particularly as it relates to uh, your people and, uh, and uh, your, was your grandfather, wasn't he? Mm. Yeah. Yes. See, he was in the period. So I feel not, I don't own Oklahoma. <laughs> but I'm very I feel have a very deep feeling because of na it's naturally my a great part in it. Yes, because uh, I've been in the historical field, and even though I never saw my grandfather, he died for before my time, mm -hmm. um, a few years. 
naturally my father and the, my, he took an active part and my uncle took an active part in the family and then they knew all the old times and then I got into this history field I really feel that I can just project myself. I just absolutely feel as if I know those old people. I just know them. And I've known many 89ers. Uh, uh, they've been good friends, you see. And I know uh, people uh, way down in southwestern Oak and all over. <laughs> and so I do feel very closely identified with the people. But we have some problems here in Oklahoma. Oh, that's... That's obvious. But we are going ahead. The Indian people, the great tragedy of the Civil War, they, well, say that after the removal, the great tragedy and the, the effects of that, sometimes a whole, uh, after the removal, they'd be settled in a, in a spot uh, in, say, the Choctaw Nation. There'd be maybe 175, several families, and they're making up a community, and they were building up, and all, uh, and uh, the weakening condition uh, that they had had to encounter in the sub in the removal had left them physically weak, mm -hmm. and so these epidemics would come, brought up the river by the steamboats, smallpox and what have you, and cholera, and uh, flu, particularly that uh, pneumonia and flu, and the whole communities would die with that uh, contagion, of course, I suppose. All, uh, one, uh, one, uh, 175, men, women, and children, all died, mm. you see. Uh, but they made their way. Now here, here's one thing. It's one thing to make a plan for a people, but carrying on that plan and making it work is another. Now, they, that was a very great idea, and I do think that our founding fathers, I do think they did have a humanitarian um, phase of their thinking, but it was, it was principally, uh, however, uh, uh, their, their uh, minds and their working was a matter of expediency to be, get the country going and developing. Uh, but they were really, I think, uh, I, well, I'll give them some credit, but it was uh, not a moral thing. Um, when you come down to the, that phase. But <coughs> now then, uh, I'm getting off my subject just a little bit. Um, so the Choctaws and uh, the Cherokees, they were building up and they had their nations going. Here came the Civil War. Well, then they were set back another one. And then here came the question. They were changed from a pastoral society to an industrial society with the coming of the railroad. They had to meet that. Then they had to fight to keep the whole their own, to so as to stay together and keep themselves together. Well, they held on, and that, that strength, there's a strength there. The, the, the Indian people, whether you like them or not, and a lot of people don't like the Indians, but I think in Oklahoma, of all the states in the Union, you have the finest feeling uh, for the Indians. I think that it is a fine atmosphere. Uh, now, of course, we, you know, some people you don't like, and there's a lot of white people you don't like. So you have your, uh, you have your likes and dislikes. Sure. Sure. But I mean, on the overall picture, it is a, it's been a wonderful thing. Oh, it seems to be. It proves. It, it proves. And right here today, Oklahoma is leading out in this great plains region, and the American race is developing. And the nucleus, whether you like it or not, is the Indian with the frontiersman, the meeting of minds. And uh, we have it, it's come out in the movie. Mm -hmm. Who was your uh, type, your image for the Western frontiersman? He's the broad hat, tall, Tom Mix style, mm -hmm. out of the Virginian. Mm -hmm. Who was the first one of that type of person, or what group? It was the mixed blood cattleman. 
Indian, a small percentage of Indians. That's one of the big uh, stories that I'm trying to evolve now in history. Okay. All righty. And then maybe the Texans won't like it, because, of course, there were all, there were a lot of white, poor white <laughs> Texans. Me. But, but, but listen, the leaders were the mixed blood Cherokees, and they stayed in Texas, and they forgot the Cherokee nation. They were prospering with big planta a big uh, cattle ranches. And you have your sweep of your cattle history. Well, uh, the, uh, we, uh, there's a big, there's a vitality and a force that is going to hold us in the great conflict now, but we're being put on trial before the rest of the world. We've got to make it. Yeah, well, that's, those are deep thoughts. And I, I don't know, prognosticate, but just like to think about it. <laughs> but Oklahoma City has been, I've enjoyed being here. I have many friends. I've belong to so many organizations that I'm going to join her. Where did you get your schooling? Um, we moved to our ranch and allotment when I was a small child, my sister. We moved to make our home there, and there were no schools along, around. And uh, my mother thought that I was too small to send to an Indian boarding school. She didn't want to send me. Anyway, there was a... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the tribal schools had been taken over by the federal government and uh, there was a kind of a period there of uh, in about 1900 and, and 1899 when the uh, Indian office and the United States government took over our schools. So uh, I was taught by my mother mostly. I w went to school to the Baptist Academy a little in Matoka mm -hmm. when we lived there in a small child. Then we moved to our ranch and we lived on our ranch the rest of my parents' life, and I was with them. And um, she um, took me up through into my high school studies, and I went to Massachusetts. She sent to me to uh, Wheaton College now, the Wheaton Seminary, mm -hmm. near Boston. Right. And that followed the old, um, more or less the old tradition of the family, all the, my grandfather having been east of <coughs> college, my father and all his sisters and brothers had been sent north and east. Uh, we were identified to that, and so they, I was sent. And uh, then uh, uh, I came back. We were in Washington, and I did special studies there, but I graduated for teaching at um, East Central College at Ada. Well, it was normal then, and uh, taught. And then uh, in the midst of this, I was going on with my master's to get a master's, and so I went back. then and uh, taught and then uh, in the midst of this I was going on with my masters to get them masters and so I went back to Columbia for a year and I was uh, finishing up my BA and getting masters now then that seems sort of peculiar but um, uh, I would have with another year I would have had both degrees you see but um, World War Two uh, One was on, and things were in a. If it's to be timed, why uh, I try to be more specific. Well, I think we can. Uh, now then, if you get some points this, quickly. Both this time now to uh, your activities in and around Oklahoma City and some of your reflections. Now, how long you been here at the? 
uh, historical society? I've been in this position since uh, July 1st, 1943, in this position, mm. 1943. Uh, I was associate editor up to in 1955, and in, since 1955 I've been the editor of the Chronicles of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. which is the quarterly magazine published by the Oklahoma Historical Society. Now, um, in the point of publications, the Chronicles is the oldest continuously published magazine in Oklahoma. Understand, there were magazines long before uh, the Chronicles. Mm -hmm. The first issue of the Chronicles in January uh, 18, 1921, mm -hmm. but, and were, but they all folded up, see? Mm -hmm. And there are many magazines started since, but they folded. And so, as a magazine uh, of, the, of this type, it has uh, uh, continued. And um, the only, I'm doing my 84th issue of the Chronicles, and it'll be out this week, 84th, as, uh, in editorial capacity. Well, you seemingly enjoyed this. Well, uh, yes, uh, um, maybe too much, uh, too much. Uh. Um, this way I uh, want to attain a certain thing. Uh -huh. And, I, oh, I see so much that uh, the great part of me is to hold myself in with, within the bounds of a limited field that we can cover in each issue. But uh, the problem in this editorial department, which may not now touch upon Oklahoma City, but it does too, uh, is uh, how are you going to get the copy for this magazine? We have wonderful mag manuscripts. I myself, if I had the proper stenographic yet, and we could get exact copies of wonderful manuscripts. We have wonderful material. But that has to be annotated. It has to be edited. It has to be presented to the people so they could get anything out of it. You, you can't just take a raw manuscript. For instance, we couldn't take a rare manuscript and send it to the printer. It has to be typed. It has to be annotated. It has to be explained. Now, I could devote myself and do, do all that and get the magazine out. But the, pro the, the magazine is not supposed to be uh, just one person. Or, uh, it is to, supposed to keep up the life of the people. How are you going to get people to write up these articles? That's my problem. So therefore, um, I've taken up an on the side, which I have jo enjoyed, and I think I've done, we've done a great work out of the Historical Society on the marking of historic sites. That took me out into the field, and I would beat people, and then they'd get, uh, uh, um, individual would be interested and say, he knew so, I'd say, well, why don't you write an article? Or he said, it was offered to write, and then the manuscript would come. Now, they didn't just come over the desk, and that magazine has been out, maybe in late, might not been right on the day, day and the hour, like a newspaper. But it was published regularly every quarter since 1943. And I think uh, there are many things that I wish were, uh, would, uh, we could have had better. But I think it's been a wonderful thing to do. For instance, the War Memorial. Uh, that took you in Oklahoma City. The historic sites took you in Oklahoma City. Now. Uh, in this historic site's interest, and um, the appropriations were made for uh, marking historic sites the, for the first time in uh, 1949 by the legislature. They limited a uh, appropriated a small amount for which we could, uh, with which we could uh, purchase uh, uh, plaques and set them at places over the state. Mm -hmm. We were counted it up in our prices, and our contract had to go through the state highway. The state highway has been wonderful in its cooperation with the historical society in this. And um, this was the $10,000. They had the, the right.
right, oh, they, uh, they, I think they had charge of the money. And then they would decide on where it should be placed. For instance, we'd say this is a site, but they would have to have the say whether it would be uh, on uh, beyond a culvert or where it would be on. And that was necessary for hazards. Sure. Well, <coughs> now in this historic site, then the people in the Oklahoma City, they had been interested in historic site through Dr. Thoburn way back early. I had started in with historic sites way back in the 1920s and made a tour with Mr. Bryce on historic sites out in the state. Well, Mr. Thoburn had started the idea of historic sites way back before Bryce and, and, and early times, and he had studied these sites, and particularly with the reference to the Chisholm Trail mm -hmm. and tracking that down, getting <coughs> that out. And the legislature provided a special resolution on having this, that trail studied by engineers, and they w went into it in a in a really a, a very technical way, and they have it marked, and we made the map, and we know where the Trisholm Trail went, the main trail. Of course, it had branch trails. Uh, well, now in that, uh, come back to Oklahoma City, the 89ers in this swirl of interest took up the matter, uh, and I think that was through uh, Dr. Thoburn mm -hmm. and his influence and his interest um, of marking historic sites, well, they became interested. And so the 89ers erected 17 little plaques, small plaques, at different sites within the boundaries of Oklahoma City. Well, this thing, they uh, put them up. And they forgot them. Didn't know where they were. <laughs> so they uh, got to think, well, where are these historic sites? We have them marked, and we have it in the minutes, we spent our money. Well, they, we know we marked them. Well, who should have to go and see about them? <laughs> With one of the 89ers who was present, Miss Golda Sleeve and I, we went to, and worked out. Every one of those markers, and you'd be surprised where they, we found <laughs> one we didn't find, and that was for the, um, it was out. It was for, had to do with that canal down in southwestern Oklahoma oh. City. So we have an article in the, came out then right. finally with the historic yeah. markers. And then the history of uh, Oklahoma City. Now, uh, and was also identified uh, through Dr. Thoburn, and the DAR took up the question of the earliest settlement in this region. And that was through Dr. Thoburn. And the marker was set up. Let me see, that must have been about in uh, the 19th, I can't get the exact date, but it was before I came back to this. I was in on a special, by the way, with the Historical Society on special research for two years um, before Bill Murray's administration, when um, Holloway and Tra uh, Holloway was in, we had a, I was on a special uh, program here for two years, and then went back to freelancing, and then I came in on, uh, in 43 regularly on the staff. Well, anyway, uh, the upshot of this interest of the D DAR in marking through the influence of Dr. Thoburn, they put up, set up the monument for uh, the Jesse Chisholm Post, which was founded in 1858 uh, out in Council Grove. And you can find the marker if you will follow 10th Street before you get to the bridge that crosses the North Canadian River. And there's a little park, state par uh, city park in the Council Grove area, and you'll find a big red boulder, and on that a plaque by the DAR giving the history of that site. Now, Oklahoma City was not named Oklahoma City till 1924. What was it known as? Oklahoma? Oklahoma. All oh, the cancellations of your own ropes. Oklahoma. <laughs> All right, so. You stem from eight, about 1924, I think it was. Uh, I better check that date. But it was in the 19 by that time. It became definitely Oklahoma City. 
it was the post office was established here a way before as Oklahoma Station two years before the run. This was a site. This is was going before the 89ers came here. Mm -hmm. The 89ers came in and put the stakes down, but this was already a going concern. Mm -hmm. Now that stems out of the history of Jesse Chisholm's post and the, the steps of ranching and so forth. And this is an old area in the state. Oklahoma City has deep roots mm. as a site. As a site, yeah. Mm. So I've been interested in that part <laughs> of the of historic sites. Now then, um, for the riders, I've been with the... Um, well, why did they call it Oklahoma City? Why did they change it to City? Well, they had to. Uh, yes, to they had to put the... Had, or you had to give, yes. But it was so well established that they had to breathe. Well, they, the they, but they referred to it as Oklahoma City way early. Oh, they but did. it wasn't a, it wasn't a regularly accepted uh, name. Oh. But you see the you see you have the post office will carry a name long years. It was Oklahoma Station. Huh? Oklahoma Station then, but just Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma. Hmm. Uh, there's your first post office. If you well, don't mind, you can go on and I see, see it. That, no. 1887 and 1887, when the railroad came to the post office. It was a, uh, the first post office was in a box car, moved along with your right of way workers. And uh, Seymour, it was called Seymour. But it finally got down to Oklahoma Station. Because Oklahoma Station was important because the of Fort Reno was out here and the uh, Cheyenne Arapaho Agency was at B Darlington. And this made a very close railroad connection with that big installation out there, government installation. And the, the uh, stagecoaches ran from, uh, uh, from Oklahoma Station, the, the Santa Fe Railroad Station, out to uh, uh, Fort Reno. Mm -hmm. And uh, their, their ranching was the main start, you see. And that's, uh, Al Reno, has, uh, that fort was gradually turned into the uh, reformatory, the penitentiary. Oh, no. Isn't that on the oh, same no, side? Oh, no, no, no. No, that is part, um, part of the ground. Oh, part of the ground. Uh, that's not, not, it's a reform school. No, the old post is up uh, west of El Reno. And uh, some of the old buildings, it's been taken over by the Oklahoma State University as an agricultural station. And old um, Darlington, which is about two miles north and north of the river, uh, which was the Cheyenne Arapaho Agen Agency, uh, which was founded in about 1871 to, um, by Darlington, Britain Darlington, the name for him. Uh, that uh, is now the buildings that were left there. Yeah, I, don't, I think there's one of the original buildings there. It's now the state uh, uh, quail, and um, it's a uh, preserve for uh, the hatching of quail oh. and uh, wild turkey, and uh, they have a regular uh, state hatchery there for supplying and keeping the um, reserves, game preserves, stocked. I think maybe they have some pheasants. Probably. Uh huh. And I don't know what, but whether they've tried pear chicken or not, but I know they have turkeys. And then they restock the game preserved areas. And quail. That's, it's tremendous. That's the old Arlington. That's the old Chalk China Arapaho Agency. And the, um, the uh, 9,000 acres of the military reserve that was held out of the Cheyenne Arapaho uh, reservation for government purposes. Uh, was uh, is owned really owned by the Cheyenne Arapaho. The uh, but uh, instead of um, keeping that up as a historic site, why they uh, got an idea of putting an agricultural station there, and they've taken over the old buildings that are left, and they moved, uh, which was a tragedy, moved the old original uh, office and uh, bi first building at. Um, the Fort Reno, which was occupied by General Sheridan, and uh, it was out there in the area, and it was 
quite an interesting thing to see it in its original location. El Reno got all stirred up. No, we're not going to leave it out there. We're going to put it right down in the middle of the town. They got it down there. They moved that cabin and put it into a plot, and they let the weeds go around it now in the midst of El Reno. They all should move it back. And the big cemetery. You see that cemetery, uh, old graves in there, date way back. And in World War II, many of the, the uh, German prisoners of war, now that, in, that didn't mean just the common German soldiers, that meant educated officers were brought as prisoners of war and they were in this reformatory building. That was the prisoners of war camp. Oh. And though many of them died, and they're buried in that uh, cemetery. It was, it's a 200-acre plot, mm. and, uh, with, and over on one side of these uh, graves. Well, at the end of uh, World War II, in the international situation where the Germans wanted maybe to have their bodies of their uh, boys or their sons or husbands brought back to Germany, why, that was quite a question of, uh, of uh, the military and the State Department. So finally, some of the German families came and to see how they were taken care of, those graves. And they came and they said, no, we won't move them back. We'll leave them right there. So it goes down from Indian times, Indian wars, the white man on down through a period of time and takes in World War II and brings it right up to today. It's a wonderful um, plot, 200 acres, and we're hoping to have it established as a national cemetery because the national cemetery over at Fort Gibson, which was established in the 1870s, and there are many, uh, you see now, a national cemetery brings uh, bodies from all over. Right. It's pretty nearly full. I don't think they have much more room for any more. Mm. So we have to have another one. So the proposed because um, there are uh, some of the old uh, wells and the provisions for water, and it's uh, in a fine location, and that's the strategic place for a national cemetery. And plenty of room now, a large, comparatively large area. And I think that that's on, uh, in the making. I, think, I don't think it's been definitely signed, but it should, mm. because it's right in the heart of the country, and it has so much, um, and it's uh, a good location. No other state should fight for it, because they have it a nucleus there. The waterworks and the care and the provisions of um, cemetery procedures mm. started there and famous uh, historical <coughs> associations and so forth. How long has this building been here? This building has been here since, was erected in 1929, and the Historical Society was uh, located in the basement of the state capitol at the time, mm -hmm. and this was built particularly and especially for the Oklahoma State Historical Society, which you will see on the mm -hmm. front of the building, and it was opened in, um, November eight, 1930, Ooh. with a big open house. And I happened to be on that special um, assignment in the Historical Society, which was a two-year period, and they cut the appropriations and didn't carry it on. But it was for research and writing on five tribes, and my desk was right there. And I'm, when I came back, I came back into the same office. <laughs> now watch the will building erected and uh, was here and one of the first to come in to see the building and it was a great thing for Oklahoma City mm -hmm. and Oklahoma City was, has took a part uh, in the uh, dedication of course people here in the city and were 
uh, immediately could come to the entertainment, the, the dad, the big ball, let's see. Okay. Uh, the opening of the, the building. Then, uh, now I've been identified with the writers. I've remained uh, with First Presbyterian Church, but I have, I just couldn't do everything. I could, I, I haven't, uh, I've been, a, I think, a member in good standing through <laughs> the years. But uh, uh, not uh, too active, I mean, in full church work. Mm -hmm. But I'm always, of course, we're ground in Presbyterian. Although my grandfather was Southern Presbyterian, you think our contemporaries uh, will uh, are contributing really to the history of the state? Yes, I think they're trying their very, very best. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that has interest in it, I didn't, ha I had no idea that it would reach such proportions with these four, this 14 flag proposition. Um, Mr. Miller of the Oklahoma asked me one time, he said, I wish how many nations have ever been with, uh, claimed, had claims in Oklahoma? And uh, they uh, proposedly, supposedly wanted an article, but I didn't, uh, but I got through the research and I found that 20 nations, territories, and states. We, of course, uh, were a part of Indiana first. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oklahoma was under the laws of Indiana. And theoretically, our first governor was William Henry Harris. Theoretically. Theoretically, yeah. Way back in, when he was at, um, let's see, isn't that Vincennes, Indiana? That sounds. Mm -hmm. Where his uh, old home is. Uh -huh. um, let me see now. What did I say? Harrison? Yeah, Harrison's home. Mm -hmm. William Henry Harrison. Mm -hmm. Then it went into Missouri Territory. We were part of Missouri Territory. Then in 19, as soon as the ink was dry on the Spanish Treaty of 18, uh, West Florida of 1819, became Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas Territory. And Arkansas Territory has had a, has had a great uh, part in Arkansas and its laws and all, uh, have had a part in the uh, history of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Stemming out of Fort Smith and the uh, courts, U.S. courts. And uh, it was strange uh, to show how names will be carried by the post office department. I actually have seen a letter which was canceled. Caddo, Arkansas Territory. And that was this Caddo down here in Indian Territory. So uh, now I get out of Oklahoma City. Every time I get started, I get off into the <laughs> Hold us into this. Uh, the canal, I think, was interesting, and the jogs in the street, and um, the old fight between the Seminole and the Kickapoos. Uh, they, uh, that, uh, of course, I knew nothing about it except through the history. And I know people, there are more persons that know the uh, uh, details of that history than I do. But uh, the, the, uh, to watch it, but um, I think uh, as in every plan, there has to be a far vision too. Because uh, you can have your dream and your, your plan, but now to have the vision to see that it will be something that is very constructive and it will not cause a, uh, in as far as one can see, a another blight, as it were. Mm -hmm. 
there's our problems, it seems to me, in the city. And I think that uh, one of the things about the Oklahoma City when it was first planned was planned too small, too idea, too tight, little old 25 foot lots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of cities and a lot of towns were planned that way because they, I suppose it was psychological, they wanted to stay together, the closeness of it. Oh, where did the idea come from? Where did the 160 acre idea? They thought that was a. That was a great tract when you had your uh, Homestead Act of 1863. Where did these people come from? They came from the east where they had little, little farms. Uh, New England now, Kansas, right. dominated uh, Kansas, New Englanders. Right. And they came out of that period where uh, old hillside, and if they could work a 10-acre plot, well, that was something. And to have 160 acres was something to come for. Clear land. But now, the 160-acre idea won't do. They're going back to another trend. You found that you couldn't do it, and the Indians and all are caught in this world. That was the end of this, the Indian when they adopted the Homestead Act, because they wanted to adopt that for the Indians. You can't do it. And we're in the mechan mechan uh, age of mechanization, and what is the trend? It's to get larger areas for your wheat farms, larger areas for your ranches, and there is uh, the question of erosion, the question of water uh, controls, and uh, forestry, and all these, all these things have come in the conservation movement, and it goes to the, the, the 160 acre idea is a very small idea and it, uh, it, we've gone into a different type of uh, agriculture. It's, a, it's very interesting to see how they work these ranches way out there in the Panhandle, that Hitch Ranch. It's really big business though. Oh, say, do you ever want to get a story? That is a story, that Hitch Ranch. That, mm, that's just tremendous. They have, he started out uh, as a, just a 160-acre idea man, the old man, the original hitch, way back before uh, in the Territory of Seminole was organized. And he took his land claim and it's grown and they're one of the big grants the family. Oh, 100,000 acres and there's not a cow on it. They uh, they do all their um, ranching in the feedlot type. Everything they feed, the water, the, it's clean as a whistle. Everything is done by mechanization. Mm -hmm. uh, feed is put in the troughs. Those that feed is scientifically tested, and they they weigh those those stock. They have five thousand in the pan in those <laughs> pans. They have them herded the finest grade. And they're the finest grade steep, steep uh, uh, beef. And uh, when that goes, that goes on the market at a high price, and that furnishes the big thick stakes for your stark club, the big car clubs. Then the next on down, they grade them. Sure. Oh, uh, wh why? And the way they feed, they, they, they have that feed scientifically in the water, sure. and they're just tremendous. Treated like babies, but I, I now they're 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 enough open air and all and scientifically. But I tell you, I don't think the meat, and the turkeys. And what do you think of our city today? What do you say? Oh, the city. Oh, I think it's uh, I think it has a wonderful future. But uh, in the past, it's been uh, a rural type. It isn't. It doesn't have the metropolitan air that Tulsa. But it can be. Being so large, the largest in area of any in the world, isn't it? Now, near 650 acres square, uh, 50, 650 miles. square miles. I mean, isn't it 650 square miles? It's uh, over. Oh, it's six, yeah. Over 650. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty big city. I, I was called on that. 
I wrote the uh, histor the I wrote the Encyclopedia Britannica article for the Book of the Year for years, and uh, I brought that out, and they called me. I said, "Why? Uh, what is it? Uh, the island Oahu? Oahu is the larger. They claim in Hawaii, in the state of Hawaii." Well, I never did answer it. They sent the letter on from the editorial department. And in the meantime, <laughs> before I could get it answered, they'd bought more land and was still larger. So I <laughs> thought, well, don't use me answering that. This man was saying, oh, how, oh, who said, what does Oklahoma think about? They don't, they're, they're just thinking about themselves. But, um, Uh, a city and a nation is made by its people. And we, uh, I don't know, I can't get up a lot of enthusiasm for being a million population. But it may be, it'll come in this urban movement but there's going to be an awful lot because of conflict in that because after all these groups as they came everyone brought a problem every wave we're going to get waves of immigration companies moving in waves and it's all going to hit here and they are used to a way back there, and when they get here, then it'll be a this way. They're not going to just come from, say, they're not going to come from an industrial center in Michigan. Uh, and they've liked Michigan, stayed in Michigan, and they've been with a big company, and bring, move them down. Conditions different. Entirely different life. So, uh, in, the, in trying to get and I don't know, I don't think we ought to aim, should aim. I think we ought to smooth out what we have and, of course, naturally grow, but mm -hmm. it's going to be slow. And this thing of getting so fast, oh, get it out on the minute. Put it out on the time. Oh, <laughs> oh it does. That's right. Just look how long Oklahoma City's been growing since 1858. It can be proven. I just haven't written all of it yet, and I have still a little more research to do to finish up my thesis. But um, it takes a long time, and I think such, uh, uh, I think your cultural life is take, is, is rooted in, in, in your cultural activities. Awful lot of activities. Now, one of your wonderful buildings is the Oklahoma Historic, I mean, is the Presbyterian Church. That's a beautiful building. Yes, and then the Oklahoma City University on its great plan. It's been an old institution. It has a force. I'm strong in that. Now, Dr. Thoburn was was deeply interested in the Epworth College, and it was through the, his interest in being here, and he was um, secretary. He was secretary of the territorial agricultural department back at when it was at Guthrie, and he was more or less always kind of a journalistic. He took the historical field, but uh, he was, uh, and he was the one that found it. it. They didn't call it the Chamber of Commerce. What did they call it? Well, it had another title. I can't think just now. When it was organized, mm -hmm. and it has been a going concern ever since. Mm -hmm. So these these influences seem to come to bear. Now, I'm interested in them. Um, then 
a question of your sites, a question of your parks, a question of your cultural. But uh, uh, you, you have to have something back. There has to be a spirit. There has to be a, a beginning. And uh, our beginnings are deep when you think about it. And I think that they should uh, uh, come in and be kept thought and uh, thought of in the picture, not forgotten. Kept alive. Uh huh. And, and not that we are going to be in the past, but we know the things, and we learned of those things that happened through that. Be aware. And the development. Mm -hmm. Be aware. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a force. And I think now. Uh, this uh, your Christian college is another. It's a new institution. Comparatively so, yes. Yes. It's a new institution, and I do think that it has a place. But, of course, Oklahoma City University is the first one. Mm -hmm. sure. And it now it has, it's, it's larger, it's growing out. That's the name of it. Oklahoma City University, and I hope it remains the name, but it has a wider uh, uh, influence and a wider scope than just Oklahoma City. It has a wide scope in the oh, educational well, yeah, state, field. nationally and internationally. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It's the same way with our other institutions, like you take um, uh, the University of Oklahoma, that wonderful University Press. Great. Oh, yes. <laughs> University Press is just wonderful. And it's books abroad. Why, it goes deep. And then you take uh, Oklahoma State University, it's gone deep into the agricultural through its, that Ethiopian project. Yes, yes. So there were the, the things that stemmed out <coughs> that, are d uh, that center because of this was the capital. That's right which is a motivating force for a lot of things, but being the state capital. Now, there's a lot made, oh, and jokingly and seriously, on the question of the stealing the capital from the country. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. But um, logically, Oklahoma City is the place. The only thing is that oftentimes a capital city will be dominated by the outside interests and it will hurt your city. You see? But I don't think it's hurt Oklahoma City yet. Seems to have worked to its advantage. Yes. Yes, <coughs> but that is fact. You know that a lot of these uh, state capitals are just small mm -hmm. in the in the states. They are not the outstanding city. Well, we have we have the outstanding city in the state. There doesn't seem to be any question about it. Well, uh, no, I uh, I think that uh, Tulsa comes in for a a large uh, share I don't I don't know I'm 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 in favor of Tulsa for some things mm -hmm. not uh, to the detriment of Oklahoma City but that we must recognize that there is other there is another force too another entity mm -hmm. in Oklahoma And uh, the same way, then, now, uh, Muskogee. It had its entity, but poor old Muskogee, it's had some rough treatment. <laughs> but I think it has its place in history. It's a nice uh, city. Yes. And, uh, oh, uh, Judge Williams, he said, he used to come in here when he was president of the Historical Society, and he'd sit here by the hour and talk about himself, his background, and about the state questions and articles on the Chronicle. He was deeply interested in the Chronicle. He wrote all the necrologies. Every time a friend of his died, he put a necrology in. So he got to 
portion of the time you'll find necrologies all taking over the chronicles. But that was his deep interest. Anyway, um, uh, he said, he said, these cities, he said, they're selfish. They're just like people. Said they get in and they want they want to grab everything and for themselves. And he said these cities are selfish. <laughs> that was his that. We talked the other day with uh, Leslie McCrill. Oh, did you? Yes, had a very nice conversation with him. What did you? About he? two hours with him. Oh, yes, you see. Uh, oh, bless the McCrill. is a wonderful. Yeah. He's fine. A friend I, in the Historical Society I, and I, editorial. Uh, before I left, I had uh, him read about uh, oh, the Ger Geronimo poem mm -hmm. that he wrote about Geronimo and a few of the others, about 22 pages. So we'd have it on tape as a historical record. That's Frank. He's a great man. Oh, uh, Leslie McReal. Why, well, my, he has, um, he has worked with the Chronicles. Yes. And he's just, he's really a fine mind. And, um, uh, uh, of course, he's a poet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but uh, he understands um, uh, research and uh, symbolism and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And he has an article on this uh, now in our projection of... Um, uh, the Fernandina site of that original trading post, which was written up, and he translated from the Listoire de Louisiane by Margrave, the records, French records, and uh, uh, of course we'd known of them and had had some translation, but he retranslated, and then we wrote, he wrote the article on Fernandina. I of course edited and added to it, mm -hmm. did have had a part in the background, but it was under his name, and then added up. Uh, an appendix as to the naming of Fernandina, which the site of, uh, the site of which is five miles northeast of Newkirk on the west bank of the Arkansas in Kay County, and the naming of it and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but now our next one was this this uh, runestone project. You know what the runestone is? Did he mention it when he mentioned it? Uh, the runestone and uh, our theory of its oh, yes. naming? Yeah. yeah. I think we really have come to the place where we know where it was planted and who planted it, who wrote on it. And it, it is, that's a long story. And he has it in an article. I said, Mr. McGrill, I wish you could sell that because, of course, we do not buy. And he's been a contributor and uh, he has worked. And I thought that if he could sell his story, I'd be glad. Uh, we would print it, but it would have to be a, just a little bit different type in the Chronicles. And it's ready. I'm about ready to stand back of the theories and we can prove. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Miller said that uh, in his column the other day, R.G. Miller in his mm -hmm. smoking room said that uh, Minnesota's going to take up the uh, rune stone, their famous rune stone, and take it to the New York World's Fair. I said, it might be a good idea that if they take up the heathen rune stone. Well, that's an impossibility. Don't believe that. <laughs> that now uh, that kind of thing gets to be cheap. I don't like it. <laughs> Leave it sitting where it is until we get something definitely moving around so much. Uh. Now then, I know that you've that there have been an awful lot of wordy, wordy, word. <laughs> well, I think we've covered a great deal of it. I, I know that... The well, uh, of course, my, as I had told you that my interests uh, uh, have been statewide, but of course I've been here as a resident right. now since 1932. Now, what affects the state, uh, in most cases, will have some sort of... Uh, reaching into the city because we're mm -hmm. all the same in a sense. Mm -hmm. I of course have friends that have uh, were earlier settlers here in the state. I mean in the city. And then of course um, a friend of the Shirks, mm -hmm. Mrs. Shirk. I didn't know the father. I knew 
uh, but Lucille and George particularly, and their brothers, and I've known them, and of course they're they're deeply Oklahoma City. Yeah. And uh, then others like the Bots, and uh, then uh, others of the 89ers who um, feel deeply on Oklahoma City because they are, were among the original settlers. And then, of course, my family knew the original settler back at Atoka were the McClure's, and the McClure's are the first ones of Oklahoma City, hmm. although they haven't been written. And that comes into the Jesse Chisholm story and the Chisholm Trail and the ranching in this area that I'm working on. Bill McClure, he made the run from the Meridian line out here, out by Choctaw. They didn't know exactly where that Meridian was, but it, they knew it ran. And so his ranch place, which he, he had purchased after the Civil War from Jesse Chisholm's estate, Williams Estate, and they, he had his ranch out there, it's about 25 miles in the day of the run. Well, he had thousands of cattle. He bought out the old 77C, 77C ranch um, brand. He started, had a relay of horses all the way from where Choctaw is to the side of Oklahoma City. He took the first 160 acres. It's this Mayfair edition. Oh, really? The old Mayfair edition. Huh. They were a part, and they were the ones that, that really kind of, he was the one that really started, um, was very active in the shipping because he was ordered to get his cattle out of here by the presidential proclamation and executive order mm -hmm. through the Interior Department. Mm -hmm. And his cattle had run in this area since 1869. Mm. And uh, he was <coughs> identified with and friend with Montford Johnson, who was down in Chickasaw Nation, and this Council Grove and so forth, in the early inches. Now, that's long before the boomers ever started coming in here. Well, I want to thank you again for taking your time. Well, uh, perhaps. Uh, well, uh, we I think we better able. stop now. I think you had long enough. You'd be tired <laughs> of me. Well, hardly that, because it's going to be. Now, if there's any one pe pointed question that you want to ask, you better. I I can't think. I just go along. Oh, I remember there were certain things. I remember when the Sa Mary Sudik blew in, how excited we were, and, yeah. <laughs> and then I remember the terrible s snowstorm, and um, I was at the Capitol before we moved here, and let me see, that must have been 29. Oh, that was the worst, and was three weeks in January, and I'm telling you, when we'd leave that west door of the state Capitol, the, uh, we'd go through a tunnel almost of 10 feet high of snow. That was the worst blizzard I was ever in. Oh, my, that was terrible. <laughs> and then the Dust Bowl yeah. days, and how, and then I'm, then Bill Murray. <laughs> What's the funny story? Well, I like to, what we'd like to do, I'd like to come back sometime and talk about a few of them. Well, now we've missed it, I think. Well, I'll get tired of me. I don't want to. Well, give all the history. Let's go for now, and uh, we'll give you a call in for